Hello and welcome to the Space News Commercial Space Transformer series, where we aim to give you a behind the scenes look at the people and companies driving the space industry's commercial transformation. I'm Jason Rimbo, senior staff writer at Space News, and today I'll be talking to Pete Canito, CEO of space infrastructure company Redwire. Redwire has grown rapidly thanks to an aggressive acquisition strategy, and the company also recently expanded its spacecraft platform lineup with three newly branded platforms, US Focus, Thresher and Mako, and Hammerhead for Europe. Thresher is a tactically responsive Leo platform. Mako is a high agility Geo Mio platform for rendezvous and proximity operations. And Hammerhead has a long history of reliability in serving European Space Agency missions in Leo. Okay, Pete, thank you very much for your time today to dig into what you've got going on at Redwire and what's coming up for the industry. I've got a lot of questions for you if you're ready for them now. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Fire Good away. Deal. Yeah, well, I will. So Redwire's inorganic growth strategy is one of the many things that differentiate it from other space companies out there. How favorable is the current financial climate for acquisitions and, and what trends are you seeing in terms of how price tags for the companies you're interested in um, have been changing? Yeah, I, I would call the uh, current environment to be more favorable than previous uh, in the last year. Uh, it's not uh, the, the best uh, I've ever seen it. It's kind of a mixed bag depending on uh, you know where different companies are and uh, how they've performed over the last couple of years. Uh, but I think the biggest change that we've recognized in the last year is um, is that there are some values out there. Uh, Redwire has always been a value play. Uh, from an M&A perspective, we look for accretive deals. Um, so uh, that has been that was harder after 2021 when there was uh, a lot of excitement in the marketplace uh, and uh, valuations were really high. I think many of the valuations have come down to be more realistic uh, in certain um, areas of the marketplace or depending on a company's uh, specific unique circumstances. And that's exciting for us because that has uh, created some new opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. What criteria does Redwire use to identify acquisition targets? And and yeah, has that changed at all as, as companies get cheaper to buy? How opportunistic are you? Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty robust selection criteria, as you can imagine, because uh, we've been at this for a while. Uh, some of it we think of as being proprietary, but um, at a general level, there's two types of organizations that uh, Redwire looks for. Uh, one would be transformational m and and that's you know, something larger, uh, probably in the more like the 50 to $100 million uh, in revenue. Uh, we we look at that as uh, a potential, you know, one category, if you will, of potential targets. And then you have your tuck-ins, which are much smaller, where our criteria is usually focused on uh, where it fills a particular gap uh, for us in our strategy, or it accelerates a particular strategy we have. As example, uh, for the hair acquisition, we had been talking about uh, since the very beginning of 2024, our growth strategy of moving up the value chain uh, and going after bigger uh, programs as a prime contractor. And uh, Hera uh, really accelerated that strategy for us by adding two new platforms uh, to the platform portfolio that we had already been building. So um, usually what we look for uh, is either some transformational M&A that's going to give us the scale that we've been after uh, because scaling is an important part of the Redwire strategy uh, because you get uh, key uh, operating leverage on that. You, nobody wants to be a, a small cap uh, forever uh, for a long time. And there's a lot of uh, certainly financial benefits to having scale when you're a public company. Uh, but there's also the key tuck-ins that are either accelerating the strategy or bringing in some new, uh, uh, really uh, complementary technology to our portfolio. Uh, and that's what we look for. On top of that, I would say uh, we generally only acquire companies uh, that are either break-even or EBITDA positive. Uh, we don't uh, buy companies that are still in their phase of growth where they're uh, uh, investing, uh, in, you know, in, and, and, and as a result, having negative EBITDA, 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's not really our focus area. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what, what areas in the space industry are you seeing significant acquisition opportunities there, maybe due to, to companies struggling with capital constraints at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's case by case. Um, again, I, I don't want to uh, give it all away, <laughs> but uh, I, would, I would say uh, uh, one area that we look at is um, technologies that are dual use commercial uh, national security where the company had been primarily focused on commercial opportunities uh, because there was this time period, as I know you're well aware, uh, where uh, people anticipated that commercial was going to be the fastest growing area of, uh, of the space uh, sector. And it's actually played out that national security has had more at least uh, stable uh, and robust growth versus robust growth. Uh, so there's a couple of companies out there have uh, really uh, incredible technologies that they've invested lots of capital into that were targeting a commercial application, but in fact have national security applications. And in some cases, um, their focus on the commercial segment didn't play out, and um, therefore they're uh, in a little bit of a financial um, pickle. Uh, but we uh, have the ability to acquire that technology and rapidly move it into a national security pipeline since uh, Redwire is uniquely positioned with a lot of our investment in uh, national security, security infrastructure. Makes sense. Okay, well, then the natural follow up to that then is how does Redwire ensure that acquired companies will integrate smoothly and contribute to overall strategic goals? How do you prioritize potential acquisitions with, you know, while avoiding overextending your own resources? Yeah, well, in M&A, uh, more the, so than a lot of other aspects of running a company, experience really matters, right? I think uh, people uh, expect m a to be kind of this set of axioms that are going to be true in all circumstances. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's really not how it plays out. I would liken it more to a set of plays in a playbook that you choose from depending on the circumstances. Uh, so for instance, if you're acquiring a carve out from a, a large company that is divesting a particular uh, segment, uh, that's a very different playbook than if you're acquiring a, a founder run company, right? So, you know, I'd say the first thing uh, that makes it so Redwire uh, uh, can be so aggressive with uh, m and is, is our experience with it, right? Uh, not only with Redwire, but this is the third uh, platform buildup that I've worked on. And uh, we have a really experienced team in m and uh, and 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 that's a big differentiator. Now, even just within Redwire, we've done 10 acquisitions now. So we have a lot of great lessons learned. And um, much like people would talk about uh, a learning curve in the economic and uh, schedule benefits you get on a manufacturing floor, uh, we have a learning curve uh, that benefits us uh, from the fact that we've done M&A so many times. Uh, we have uh, really well-defined processes, really well-defined strategies. Um, and again, uh, when you think of it as I you know, was trying to articulate as both an art and a science, uh, we start uh, the integration process during the identification phase, right? So uh, it's not like we just look at, you know, does this make sense on paper or in spreadsheets? And then uh, we, we charge forward with the deal and then worry about integration afterwards. We actually... Uh, has a set of criteria we look for um, in the target identification phase that helps us assess whether, uh, regardless of the you know complementary technology or the potential revenue synergies and whatnot, 
just is this going to be easy uh, to integrate or or could uh, maybe uh, the people or culture uh, be something that we're going to struggle with that could derail all the positives. Got it. Okay, I see. So because this is just so core to what you do, you've built up a whole library of different kinds of playbooks um, to, to, to draw from. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so that maybe, yeah, looking more inward here then, Redwire recently expanded its spacecraft platform lineup with three newly branded platforms, Hammerhead, Thresher, and Mako, each tailored for specific missions. Jawsome theme, by the way. <laughs> uh, but how do you uh how do these every week your... is shark week at Redwire? So. yes i uh, <laughs> love it um but how do you so how um it's the question though so how do these complement your overall portfolio and, and the strategy for the u.s market and beyond because there seems to be a big push here and you've mentioned this uh you know towards um the defense market is that is that fair to say well, it's certainly somewhere where we're highly differentiated, right? So uh, diversity is, is, of course, strength of Redwire, diversity of both our products as well as our customer segments. So uh, um, we tend to focus on uh, where the most excitement is. And um, one of the things that I think has really added uh, to our resiliency over the last couple of years is the fact that we can pivot depending on what's going on in the marketplace, right? So national security just happens to be an area that's really hot right now and has been very dependable uh, over the last couple of years. So we've pivoted in that direction. And because of, uh, in some cases, our backgrounds, uh, I've been working in uh, uh, national security for pretty much my entire career uh, and have the ability to, uh, uh, work with uh, in a variety of secure areas. Um, so uh, because of that background, we have the potential to leverage that. But if things changed rapidly and commercial became the hot segment, we would just pivot over there. Uh, so first and foremost is um, agility and flexibility are core uh, to our uh, uh, strategy. We uh, say often at Redwire, when space wins, Redwire wins. Uh, because we're providing those fundamental building blocks of space. Um, we've talked about our six core offerings. Um, so uh, I think right now national security is is a really exciting area uh, for us. Uh, so we're leaning into that. But fundamentally, when we look at where we're going to allocate capital, and, and I will say we take a very professionalized, uh, more traditional aerospace approach uh, to uh, our business. Um, uh, when we look at our capital allocation decisions, uh, what we do really in our strategy is we start with the umbrella of we're a space infrastructure company. Uh, so we're not necessarily a launch company or a uh, data provider. We're not doing, uh, we're not selling data streams, if you will. We, we provide uh, space infrastructure. And from there, what we do is we identify different segments of the market and we determine whether we can be a leader in that market, that segment of the market, because we have some sort of uh, competitive differentiation or not. And in cases where we cannot be a leader, uh, we tend to not focus on those areas and try to focus on the areas where we're highly differentiated. So when we started looking at this idea of moving up the value chain, uh, we decided that in order to capture a larger as a, uh, let's say, a dollar amount um, programs, uh, we recognized that platforms, having a platform was key, right? But we didn't want to be a follower necessarily uh, with uh, a platform that was uh, kind of going after, for instance, the proliferated warfighter uh, architecture uh, where you're looking at manufacture, mass manufacturing of many uh, static satellites mm -hmm. uh, in high quantities. I think that part of the market is pretty well covered. Uh, so we said to ourselves, well, where can we be a platform provider where we're differentiated? And the first thing that popped out was VLEO. Uh, it's kind of a lot of white space there. We feel like uh, we, we can and are a leader uh, in that market. And hence that was the investment in SaberSat uh, and then the subsequent award of uh, the DARPA Otter program to us. And so we'll continue to invest in VLEO because it's a platform uh, area that allows us to move up the value chain, but it's early stage enough that we can lead. The same thing is going on now with uh, Mako. 
uh, and Thresher. And what we're looking at really is dynamic space operations, uh, this, uh, and particularly in MEO and GEO, and saying, okay, what's the next generation of spacecraft that are going to come out uh, beyond the proliferated warfighter architect? And for us, we believe that is um, highly mobile and maneuverable uh, spacecraft, and, and that's essentially where we're targeting platforms. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you. I see we're running out of time here. So let's maybe let's end with what vision do you have for the company's long term role in the space economy, particularly in supporting the industry's ongoing transition from government led missions to, you know, commercially viable business models? Yeah, well, like I said, we're going to be flexible and agile. We have uh, a lot of uh, uh, the ability to work across all the segments. So I think overall, uh, our overarching strategy is to be able to uh, the pick the areas uh, that have a combination of a high potential, meaning a large total addressable market, uh, as well as somewhere where red wire can be differentiated either due to intellectual property or some sort of um, positioning that we've done uh, that makes it so uh, we 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 can build uh, we can compete uh, and uh, and achieve uh, good economics in that in that area. Good. Sorry, one more. I can't help myself. Um, Pete, sorry. <laughs> what are some of the the main challenges you see that Red Y and the industry uh, will need to overcome to unlock the the space economy's full potential? What are some of the you know incoming issues you see on the horizon? To well, yeah, the great, fantastic question. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge that I think everybody re needs to recognize is we're still a fairly early stage um, industry. Mm -hmm. um, space again has been around. Uh, for a really long time, but not in the dynamic for commercial way that you're seeing now. Uh, so this idea of um, uh, there being a commercial uh, or an industry that's primarily led by uh, commercial agile companies uh, like you see out there now going after new business models, I think people have to recognize that there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. And that's why flexibility and agility matters. Anybody who says they know exactly where uh, the vast majority of investment dollars are going to be in the next couple of years, uh, has a better crystal ball than I do. Uh, so uh, we think diversity, agility, flexibility leads to resiliency. And, and I think that's a challenge because uh, we're not like the uh, commercial aerospace or even the military aerospace uh, uh, aircraft um, industry where it's very predictable what the platforms are going to be. The missions tend to be forecasted uh, over long periods of time. Um, space is changing. I mean, the Space Force is writing new con ops uh, on a regular basis, right? They're still figuring out how they're going to operate, operate. There's commercial models out there around uh, commercial LEO destinations that I, that is is a really dynamic and rapidly changing environment. And of course, NASA itself uh, has uh, a lot of priorities with limited resources. So things change from focuses to the moon, to Mars, to commercial Leo. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge in our industry right now is trying to uh, manage such a uh, dynamically changing market. Good stuff. Okay, Pete, again, thank you so much for your time today. That's, uh, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.